Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. I'm Tyler Norton from Plastic Weekly, joined as always by John Bergman, a contributor to effectively every climbing publication <laughs> under the sun and the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall and Rebirth of American Comp Climbing. And our guest this month is the inimitable Megan Martin, uh, a jet-setting climber, ninja, <laughs> model, I, possibly even actress, hopefully, maybe in the future. <laughs> Just an all-around uh, excellent ambassador for the sport and somebody that's been involved for a very long time. We're so happy to have you on uh, joining us in June. Thanks for making the time, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. We've we've all had weird lifestyle changes. I've noticed you've been spending some time on YouTube sharing your, your workout <laughs> routines. How has that been going? Yeah, um, at the beginning of quarantine, I think like a lot of people, I was kind of unsure as to how this was going to go. And I, I was just sitting on the couch, binge watching TV and eating um, just for the foreseeable future. And then I realized, you know what, this could go on for a while. Maybe I should start figuring out a way to work out at home since I couldn't go climbing outside, couldn't go to the gym. And we didn't build, we hadn't built our wall yet. So I started with the workouts and originally I started doing them every other day. Um, and I felt like it was a great way to, you know, give people an opportunity to have a workout that they could do at home. And then it also held me accountable to film the workouts because I said I would. Uh, now I've changed it to every Wednesday and Saturday as life's gotten a little more busy and I just can't focus on climbing projects if I'm that sore all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided to film them twice a week, but yeah, they've been really fun and I feel like they've kept me in great shape. So I hope they have for other people too. <laughs> That's awesome. John, I see you're, you've posted some, some pandering on the wall behind you. <laughs> Congratulations. Right. No, Very creative. There's, there's. <laughs> um, yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to get one for Canada too, Tyler. I'll try and <laughs> The only one I could find on eBay was like it's the Canadian hockey team from like the 84 Olympics or something. It was sure, from there. So, um, so it was cool, but it was a little out of my price range. It's vintage, vintage Canadian uh, athletic banner. I'm just going to make one of those cheap t-shirts just with like Sean McCall's face right on the front. And I'm just going to ask you to wear it for all of these. I, I'd wear Sean. Heck yeah. <laughs> Sounds appropriate. <That'd> be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, let's talk, John. I, I know you had a, a word you wanted to say as we start talking about just what's uh, what's been going on in the in the climbing world. So I'll just give you the floor for a minute. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I guess just on a on a like a somber note, I think we should address the passing of Luce Duati. Um, I guess a a week ago or or week and a half ago, something like that. Um, there have been you know a lot of um, uh, kind of. What, what would you say, like memorial postings from people on Instagram and social media and stuff like that. There's been some really great, very heartfelt things. And I know our friends over at uh, UK Climbing, their podcast In Isolation, Charlie Bosco, Natalie Berry and Mike Langley, they did a nice little in memoriam kind of segment to begin their their last uh, most recent podcast. And so I thought we should just kind of say a, a word. It, it, it's just such a um, I mean, it's just a, a huge loss and and. Tyler, one of the things that I keep thinking about when I think of Luce's passing is how last year the World Cup circuit, the big story, the big storyline, overarching storyline, maybe it was Yanya's kind of clean sweep of the bouldering season. That was a big narrative, but equally as as important and as significant was the the young generation that really stamped their presence for the first time ever, the 16 year olds, you know, that were making waves on the World Cup circuit and and of course it starts with Cheon So of South Korea and also Alberto Hinez Lopez and Ai Mori of Japan and I mean the list goes on and on but Luce you know she was part of that group and so I it's certainly no exaggeration to say that the, that last season 2019 was was bettered because Luce was on the circuit and she was competing with the adults and stuff like that um I you know I her her big um, her sort of most prominent um, performance on the adult circuit was at Vail, the Vail World Cup last year, where she made it to a finals in uh, the Bouldering World Cup. And just out of curiosity, I looked up the results of that event because I kind of wanted to see where she was in the in relative to other competitors. And so I, I thought I'd share this. Luce was fifth. She got fifth place. Um, in fourth was Miho Nonaka of Japan. Third was Fanny Gibert. Second was Akio Noguchi. And, and first was Yanya Garnbrett. And so, I mean, that's just like I, the company that that was there um, just kind of really signifies probably, I think, better than anything, the talent that that Luce was and, and what a big loss it was. So I thought right. we should say that. 
Yeah, I, I struggled. Like, I, you know, it's one of those things where you just don't know what to say. Um, but the, the rough one with this, you know, we talked about David Lama passing last year and then some other historical examples of competitive climbers. But this, we're getting into the territory of like, oh, these are kids the age that like I coached. They're not my age anymore. And I'm like thinking about some of the kids that like Luce is younger than any of the kids I ever coached. And that is a real kick in the the pants. I, again, I have nothing to say. It is just, it is a tough one. I, I Megan, the question I kind of was curious about for yourself is, is as somebody that is professionally uh, an athlete, you are a climber like Luce was, and like many of the outdoor climbers who may also uh, pass from what they do is, do you feel like you might've a different um, uh, perspective or understanding when you see these things happen, just because it's, it's almost more of an occupational hazard that, uh, that you and your friends have to deal with? Yeah, I think anytime something like this happens, it kind of is a reality check. Um, I think that a lot of times in what we do as climbers, we know we're taking risks, but, you know, most of the time you're fine. So I think you often forget that there is a larger risk to be taken and, you know, a loss of a life can happen. And I think it's it's very hard to digest I think it takes a bit of time um it's always harder if you know the person and with Luce I didn't know her well but I had met her um Brooke knew her Brooke Rabatou knew her quite well and I'm very close to Brooke and uh so I had a few conversations with her and watched her in Vail and I mean like John said she was extremely talented but in addition to that she was also just so fun to watch she had so much personality and pure joy and passion for the sport so it's it's a devastating loss. I, I feel like I read about it and immediately my heart sank. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think I think it's always difficult and a real reality check that what we do is risky and we need to make sure that all the precautions are taken. And, and then sometimes even when they are, accidents happen. Um, it's scary. It's really scary. Yeah, yeah well said. I, and, and it's just, like you said, it's like it's feel like I'm still kind of processing this. I was really walloped the day it happened. I was just kind of in a funk all day and I still feel, just feel a little off by it. Um, just a, a, it's just really profoundly sad. And, you know, um, certainly it was a real honor and a, and a thrill to kind of cover her for that year when she was on the circuit and, and she's going to be missed for sure. So. 100%. Yeah. I think the, the one thing is, is uh, she was coming up in a strong generation and, um, uh, something you see a lot at the youth world championships is getting to see all these kids from different countries, like really get to know each other and really bond. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying uh, with Brooke as well. And so I think, th- you know, nothing, nothing good comes of, of a passing like this, but it, it is nice to know that there are like hundreds and hundreds of climbers her age who have a strong emotional understanding of who she was. And uh, I think that's something that, you know, she won't be forgotten by, uh, by the people that knew her for a long time. So um, yeah, yeah, sad, sad either way. Um, but yeah, anyway, the other, the one other, uh, kind of news story I want to talk about was, uh, that Austria is kind of taking a step towards, uh, bringing some competitions back. And that's really exciting for, for, the, you know, the, the whole, the debrief was completely just John and I talking about world cups that had happened. And now that they're gone, we've had to <laughs> resort to turning it into an interview show, which has been excellent. Actually, we're going to keep doing it. But I'm like, oh, okay, maybe we can start, you know, watching competitions and talking about them with each other. So I'm excited. It It is going to be curious having comps with no crowd. Um, and I'm going to be a little sad that there's no Canadians or Americans taking part. Uh, it'll be cool that, you know, a couple other countries will be involved as well. But I, I think the thing that I'm always looking forward to the most when a new comp comes on the scene is, are they going to try something different? Are they going to mm. have some new initiatives in terms of how they broadcast or how they run the event? And uh, and the nice thing is um, we don't know what comps are going to look like in a year. So I'm really glad that we're starting the process of figuring out uh, what what the new reality might be for the for the coming couple of years. So I'm excited for that. I don't know. The first one's only in a couple of weeks, like July 8th or 9th. So I'll certainly be watching and, and maybe we'll have to do uh, another episode uh, breaking it down, depending on how it goes. So, yeah, great, great news. I'm really excited about that. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm curious to hear what Megan thinks of the idea of climbing without a crowd. Um, because my only, my only frame of reference is kind of trying to train at the gym alone, which is hard <laughs> enough. Like it's already stoked uh, on the really sort of hard climbing when you're just totally by yourself sometimes. So I can't imagine 
like competing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Megan. Yeah, I think the crowd not being there is definitely going to change the vibe. Um, I would say that most athletes, most athletes generally like the crowd, and I think it helps a lot. Um, you see, you see when you have the crowd support. That's I feel like when you see a lot of um, those moments happen where someone just barely holds on or gets the top at the last second. And I think the crowd really helps in that situation. I know the only, I guess the only other comp that happened so far was the quiff that didn't have an audience. And I remember talking to a few people after they competed in that and they definitely stated how it felt kind of weird being in a competition atmosphere and not having that crowd. But I mean, I guess we have to start somewhere. I'd rather comps be <laughs> happening than not happening. And if we have to go without a crowd for a little bit, I mean, I think everyone will adapt. And it'll definitely change the vibe. But then again, athletes are probably going to be so excited to be back on the wall in a competition that maybe that adrenaline will just, you know, make it happen anyway and be just as exciting. So yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. And I'm glad that we're going to have something that we can watch again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah no kidding. All the, right. the big, real fast, the, the big moments thing is really, it's an interesting uh, sort of thing to think about, Megan, because I, I keep thinking back to the Pan Ams when, and you were there commentating with Charlie, of course, and I, I think if I remember correctly in the finals, I think Sean Bailey topped the lead route first. Um, I'm trying to, it's kind of all a, a blur, because um, I know Colin Duffy, I think, topped mm -hmm. it later I mean, anyway I, the point I, is i don't think she did it first either i think i think colin went first okay maybe? i actually maybe can't was, remember <laughs> um but I, I remember whoever topped that lead route first it like the crowd just erupted and i oh, remember yeah. i was, standing it was on the John. Floor. okay and and i was standing on the floor and i looked and like the the mezzanine railings were actually like mm -hmm. rattling because people were screaming <laughs> so loud building code um, violation but whatever well <laughs> the moment was so much better because there was a crowd there uh, that that moment in particular. And there were other instances, of course, like when Alana, you know, qualified for the Olympics mm -hmm. and stuff. But, um, yeah, it's just hard. It's hard to imagine that sort of moment without the, the added element of the crowd. It's, so. it's going to be Charlie's biggest test to date is how how <laughs> do you hype the hell out of these big moments when it's just like you three guys from Epic TV. And I don't know. It's yeah, he'll 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 have his work cut out for him, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, let's let's dive in. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot to talk about. John and I have tried to pare down as much because we don't want this to be like a retrospective on your career. Um, we'll we'll record that as a separate interview. We want to talk about kind of what you're doing uh, uh, in your life right now as somebody that's kind of moving out of competitive climbing. So uh, we'll just start with some some of the biographical stuff that we were curious about. And and one thing that John brought up was that you started climbing in in like suburban Florida, which is pretty much as flat <laughs> as it gets. Uh, and I'm I'm curious what what the culture was like. And, and I understand that, you know, you had athletic parents and so the, like having a history of athleticism wasn't new to you, but climbing certainly can't have been much of a cultural phenomenon in 2001 in like Orlando. So tell, <laughs> tell me a bit about that scene. Yeah, I think you said it perfectly. It definitely was <laughs> not a cultural phenomenon at all in the area that I lived in. And I mean, I had grown up climbing trees because I always thought that was fun but that was the only climbing I knew I didn't know climbing existed outside of that so to walk into a climbing gym for the first time and see all the holds um it was pretty mesmerizing for me and I think immediately I enjoyed it because the strength that I had from gymnastics transferred into climbing really well having upper body strength already um was really helpful for me to be successful early on in climbing and I think with kids in general, once you're successful at something, I think you want to pursue it more. But yeah, it's interesting, especially having coached in Boulder and seeing kind of how the Boulder community is just so based in climbing. And to be, I used to tell the kids all the time about my home climbing gym and how different it was from the gym that they were in. I mean, the walls, the top roping walls were 25 feet tall. <laughs> I mean, the bouldering walls, you could almost reach the top of if you were standing on the ground. So it was just a very different environment. Luckily, my gym had a few climbers that were really into competitive climbing and were also very successful. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers Nicholas Sherman, but back in the day, he had some pretty successful competition results. Um, 
Alex Manikowski has also done well in competitions, but then focused more on outdoor climbing. But those are some of the people I grew up with. And luckily, we all kind of had that same goal with climbing, which was to do competitions. And being from Florida, I think that's why my focus was into competitions right away versus outdoor, because there is no outdoor climbing in Florida. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I didn't boulder outside until I was in college. Um, Growing up, I had gone on a couple sport climbing trips with my coach uh, outside. So I got to go to the Red River Gorge and the New River Gorge. And I think I also went to Crowder's Mountain in North Carolina, but those were the only outdoor places I had been to. And then I stopped climbing for seven years and was a pole vaulter. And when I got back into it in college in Nashville, that's when I went bouldering in LRC for the first time um, in Chattanooga because it was really close. So it's just kind of funny how the area you start climbing in can kind of, you know, guide your career in a different way I think it just made sense because I had already been a competitive athlete to go into competitions but yeah the outdoor portion of climbing was something that I just didn't focus on as much for a very long time um and I mean still even I (laughs) I feel like I've I've never seen what my potential could be outside because I was always so focused on competition so for me that's that's where I want to go moving forward with my climbing as well as obviously the broadcasting (laughs) It's interesting how many uh, like top level competitors um, have a gymnastics background. I keep thinking, I wonder if gymnastics is kind of like the perfect base for, for to start kids off that go into climbing, because I think, you know, there's yourself and then there's also, of course, Brooke has a, a gymnastics background. Right. And then you, and it just goes back even like as far as like Lynn Hill in the 70s was like a, a gymnast. Um, and so it's just it's it's interesting whenever I hear people that had a gymnastics background, but it's not at all surprising because it's become mm-hmm. kind of um, like a thing that we hear over and over and over. I think gymnastics is good for any sport that requires um, you to use mainly your body. And like, cause I was also a pole vaulter and that was another sport where having that gymnastics base was really helpful in transitioning into um, pole vaulting. So I think, diving again is another one that's a good sport to go into afterwards so it makes sense again like you were saying that climbing is one of those sports because all we do is use our body and our strengths and our fingers and legs and core and that's all what gymnastics is too (laughs) yeah and it teaches you like discipline too and and like safety and all that stuff so following body awareness movement following that logic both your parents are gymnasts right Correct. Um, so my, which, which one yeah. is the better climber is the, is the question I want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say my mom because okay. she's the one who's actually tried to climb more. My dad, what he would do is like come into the gym and be like, oh, do you think I could hang on this and try to hang really quick? But he never, you know, actually went in to do a session, whereas my mom got really psyched on it. And when I lived in Florida again after college for six months, she would come to the gym with me every now and then. Um She doesn't like to go by herself so much. She always liked to go with me because she wanted me to tell her where to go and what to do, (laughs) (laughs) which I get. It makes sense. But um, yeah, I mean, I wish I got to climb with her more. So she's definitely the one who has a little more experience in climbing. I mean, I think my dad could be really good at it. He just hasn't really tried. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, So uh, something that came up in in an interview we did with Elena uh, Yip previously was that she also kind of took this. Um, towards the end of high school, as she was moving into university, she felt that I think my climbing career is over. Like she didn't see what was next. Um, she didn't really expect that she could become somebody that was a top tier climber. And, and there wasn't much incentive to either. Like, what does it matter if you, if you go on to, to, to try and compete at a world cup. Right. And then in university, uh, she had a, a dramatic change of heart and then ended up taking on this goal of wanting to become an Olympian and, and now achieving that, which is incredible. You also went through this kind of break where when you went to university, your climbing fell by the wayside and then you had a kind of uh, renaissance of your interest in climbing. Um, I think I'm most interested in, do you feel like that's a really important process for youth climbers to go through for them to experience success later on? Because you may have felt as well that there, there is a disconnect between competitive climbing as a youth climber and competitive climbing as an adult. And I, I was just kind of wondering your thoughts on on those differences and if you need time to adjust. I think that 
some people maybe need that break. Um, I don't think it's necessary for everyone. I think there's this idea that if you take a break, you could never be successful again. And I hope that that's not something that people really think because I mean, like you just said, Atlanta is a perfect example of that. And so am I, I think breaks can be healthy. I think that it's good to explore other interests if you have them. I mean, for me, the reason I stopped climbing was I, I just felt a little overwhelmed at the age of 15 about, you know, having done professional competitions and done well and then feeling like I needed to do well all the time. And, you know, early 2000s climbing was very different from even 10 years or five years after that. Like the years that I missed so much had changed. I, I mean, when I quit, I wasn't even thinking about World Cups because they people didn't do them generally from the U.S. Um, so I think that it's nice to know that even – if you take a break, you can come back because climbing is a lifetime sport. And I think that it's rare in that way because most sports don't, you don't have that opportunity and you can't come back from it. And I think that for youth climbers, if they're feeling like they're interested in something else or they just need a break, I mean, the base that they have as youth climbers will serve them so well when they come back to it. I think it's easy to get back into the swing of things. Uh, I mean, especially if you've been doing some other sport in the meantime, because you're still going to be in shape. You just have to get back into climbing shape. So I think it's nice to know that it is possible to walk away and come back. And I mean, I, I want to think in 2020, we've all realized we can always reinvent ourselves. And with climbing, I feel like it's the same way. Hmm. Well, Megan, when you, when you did decide to sort of come back after college, I, I listened to an interview. I think it was maybe like a so ill interview, if I remember correctly. It was on YouTube. Yeah. And and you, what you were, were saying in it essentially was that your your friends after college, you had friends that were deciding to go to grad school and kind of get various jobs and stuff. And you kind of decided, no, I want to make it as a pro climber, um, which and I. I, I kind of, that's like such a wonderfully confident um, <laughs> like thing to think. It's not just that you want to get back into climbing, but that you're mm -hmm. like, I'm going to be a pro climber. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, uh, that transition back into climbing. I mean, was it confidence or kind of naivete of, or, or maybe both uh, just, the, you know, all about kind of mm -hmm. entering back and becoming a pro climber at that time? I think in the mo I, I looking back on it, I think it was a bit of both. Um, I think I had the confidence because I had been successful as a kid. I just thought, oh yeah, why not? I'm sure it won't be that difficult to get back into it. But you know, having watched that happen and looking back on it, I, I think to myself, wow, I must have been crazy to think that I could just do that. That doesn't make any logical sense at all. But I'm glad I did. I took that risk and I'm glad it worked out. Um, it was an interesting process. I, I gave myself a pretty intense ultimatum. I moved back to Florida to train for the first professional competition I was going to do again. That was in August of 2012. I graduated from Vanderbilt in May of 2012. So I gave myself three months to prove that this was something that made sense to me, which I mean, that that also sounds crazy. I don't know what I was thinking, but it turned out okay. I went to the competition. I I was worried about not making semifinals and I, I made semifinals no problem and made it to finals, ended up fifth and walked away from that competition thinking, okay, like I, I could do this. The next competition I entered in, I won. So from there, it kind of just continued to build. I mean, it wasn't a hundred percent easy. I remember the first nationals I went to the styles, the style of climbing had changed so much from when I had competed earlier. Um, and I noticed that in the first couple competitions I did as well, it's just, it wasn't as much of a problem. And I mean, they were different. They had, um, fewer with well, some of the rounds were red point. Others were all on site, but it was just different than being at nationals again. And so there was a lot of learning I had to do following that first year of climbing. And I spent a lot of time working on my weaknesses and it all turned out all right. But yeah, I don't really know <laughs> why I thought that it made perfect sense to do that. And especially to think that it made sense to try to become a pro climber in an industry that still really wasn't paying people that well anyway. So <laughs> it's kind of, 
It's a beautiful naivety, I believe. <laughs> so acknowledging that there may have been a little naivete, the, I wanted to, to ask, you know, at, towards the end of your uh, competitive career, where you are spending more time broadcasting, um, when you look back to the goals that you may have set for yourself in your comp career, do you feel like you achieved most of the goals that you had in mind? Well, I wouldn't say my comp career is 100% over. It is over in the realm of USA Climbing and the IFSC, but I'm definitely still competing in other competitions, which, again, I mean, what other sport can you still compete sure. <laughs> at a high level and win great prizes? Like, that's not normal. So I feel very lucky to be able to do that. But, you know, some of the goals, definitely, um, there were definitely goals that I did not achieve. I mean, I think when I decided to go into the broadcasting side and, you know, walk away from competing in USA climbing competitions and IFSC competitions. I definitely left some unfinished goals there. I mean, a dream of mine would have been to make a world cup bouldering final. Um, the closest I got was in Bale in 2017. I believe I killed it in qualifiers qualified into semifinals, the highest I ever had. I think I was like right behind a which I was just like, ecstatic and then I bombed it in semis I touched every bonus hold but didn't get control of a single one <laughs> it was the saddest round ever so and then again standing on the podium in the bouldering nationals would have been a dream come true as well made finals a few times which I was very happy with um but yeah definitely unfinished business but I think that's life I think that we set goals and we try to achieve them and some of them come true and some of them don't, but then you build from those goals into other ones. And a goal of mine has always been to commentate and be successful in that realm and hopefully get that shot to commentate the Olympics. So that just became more of my focus and I can leave the unfinished goals um, and just move on and continue to try to, achieve other ones. <laughs> I think most people would agree if you achieve all of your goals, you probably didn't set the goals hard enough. Yeah, so I that's think that's right. appropriate. <laughs> uh, Megan, would you mind sharing how the commentary uh, gig kind of came about? Was that you seeking it out or was that people seeking you out for it? So it's interesting for the couple years leading up to that um, call for a color commentator that USA Climbing put out. Every time I wouldn't make a final at one of the bigger competitions, I'd always ask, hey, can I get in the booth and commentate? That was always like my thing that I would do. And I just remember one time someone was like, you know, at a certain point, you're going to have to figure out if that's something you'd rather do than be in the competition. But that was so hard for me because I love competitions. And so to let go of that was just something I wasn't ready to do for a long time. But then 2018 was kind of a rough, year for me because I kept getting injured and I had this hamstring injury that just would not heal. I went to Innsbruck for world championships and for that competition, I had just come off a sprained ankle and then I competed there. Didn't go that well. Um, I was happy that I could use my foot more, but it just wasn't ideal. And then came home and a week later did the first national cup of the season. It went all right. And then a week after that is when I hurt my hamstring. And I just was dealing with this hamstring injury for the whole fall. And then it just kept not getting better. And that call for the color commentator came out and around like New Year's, I believe. And it, it just was a good time for me to think about what else I wanted in climbing and you know, I'm 30 years old, not to say that you can't be older and still compete, but you know, my body heals differently. And I, I was just kind of frustrated with what I was dealing with at the time. And it was kind of just a perfect time for me to, you know, apply for that job. So I, I saw the email, which everyone who's a part of USA Climbing got, and I just jumped on it immediately. I mean, I had on camera experience from other things that I've done and I sent in my resume and all my clips and just hoped that they thought it was good enough for the job. <laughs> and luckily it worked out. Given that calendar timing, that would be very, very close to, uh, I'm guessing US Boulder Nationals probably would have been within only a couple weeks before. 
I think it was close to the combined invitational. Um, oh, okay, yeah, and that, and that was so that was the other thing. It was the first year the combined invitational right. was happening. The climbing got put had been put into the Olympics, and I'm over here knowing that I don't have a lot of speed climbing experience. And if I want to think about going to the Olympics, that's where I'm going to need to start. And I have a hurt hamstring and I just can't do that. So perfect it recipe. Me, it's all great. Yeah. It made me realize, <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe, com- oops, sorry. Maybe, com- <laughs> my cat. maybe competing in the Olympics isn't going to be something that's going to happen for me, but I would love to get to commentate at the Olympics. And I think that was another thing that really made me, feel like I was ready to make that decision. Mm-hmm. So so what I was curious about is the the um the the application you would have had to put in would be mm-hmm. only shortly before the first job. So I'm assuming oh, yeah. you were then told, "Hey, we've selected you." And then all of a sudden you have to, I, I don't remember where the first combined invitational was. Was it in like uh, California, Atlanta? I can't remember where that one was. Uh, I think it was in Utah, Lake. wasn't it? Salt or Lake. Yeah. Okay. Salt Lake. Yeah, because so, yeah, we were at multiple gyms. It was very. Yeah. So, so anyway, you're going out there, you're meeting whichever of the ESPN guys for the first time. Like how, did you feel like you had a handle on what was going on or were you just being pulled around and thrown in the chair and just left to, to kind of survive it as well as you could? So it was interesting because I didn't even know that I'd be working for ESPN when I applied. It wasn't until they, till USA Climbing had considered me as a candidate that they said we can sign a contract with ESPN. So that moment to hear that, I was so ecstatic that I'd be working (laughs) with such an awesome production company um, and network and all of that. So yeah, it was interesting to get to Salt Lake. I mean, I kind of had a bit of a, of an idea of how production works in a sense, just being on the set of Ninja Warrior for like six years um, and doing interviews and all of that stuff and B-roll and behind the scenes and whatnot. But I got there and we did our production meeting and, you know, I did my research. I went through and actually read the entire USA Climbing uh, rule book, which I had never done as a competitor <laughs> <laughs> or a coach. It's it's reality. You can't, it's true. You're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most people don't. And I, I read the whole thing. I um, Prior to getting there, we had our, obviously had production calls and I had my research done with the athletes, which again, knowing so many of the athletes made it a little easier, which was nice. But yeah, after that first production meeting at the venue, I immediately started to get extremely nervous about the day that was coming next. And um, it was funny because I remember walking to the venue and seeing one of the parents and them being like, oh, it's so nice to see you. How do you feel? I bet you're like so happy that you don't have to be nervous about competing. And I was like, I didn't sleep at all last night. I feel like I'm going to throw up. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I was just so nervous about our um, on-camera open because, I mean, I guess I hadn't really done anything like that before live. Um, Anything I had done had been more scripted. So I was definitely kind of freaking out, just not knowing the flow of how everything was going to go. Obviously, we had talked about it, but it's one thing to talk about it rather than experience it. So I was definitely nervous. But honestly, I've always felt that once the cameras are on, I feel like something happens and I can just roll with it. And I was just relying on that and having been in those situations before and hoping that it turned out all right. (laughs) I also didn't know I was doing an interview until like interviewing an athlete until like maybe like five minutes before the first time. And not only was I, you know, surprised or I guess I wasn't surprised. I just I mean, because obviously that happens, but I just didn't know what was about to happen. But then on top of that, I had to go to the bathroom. And I was thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, I don't have time to pee. And I'm about to have to interview. And I do the interview. And he was, and my producer was like, that was great. Next time, just ask a few more questions. And I was like, okay, yeah, I can ask you to do that. I just really had to go to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> so, like, little things you, like, learn as you go. But after that first day, I felt great. I understood the flow. Um, I felt prepared. And once people start climbing, it's easy because it's climbing and I know climbing. So just got to stay confident and it, all it work was, out. Well, it was interesting, Megan, because I think if I'm remembering correctly, the first combined, you were with Sam Farber. Yes. Um, and and I, Tyler, I know since I don't think like ESPN doesn't get into Canada. We, so we I don't, don't know if, get the U.S. Yeah, comps so, up but, here in Canada. I, but the, 
the the so they so Megan was with a a um say he's re- great guy Sam's a great guy but he's not a climber at all yeah. he's just he's like a freelance broadcaster I think that like mm. ESPN hired um and so it was interesting that Megan as I'm as I was watching that event I was I was thinking like well not only is you know because I knew it was kind of your debut for mm-hmm. for ESPN and whatnot and I was like and she's also having to sort of like anchor this broadcast as the climbing authority because Sam is great but he doesn't know climbing at all mm-hmm. um and so that must have just kind of added to your uh, uh I don't know responsibility. anxiety or, yeah responsibility <laughs> as well sure um just another element that kind of adds to it well and and that is an element that I didn't realize was going to be as large going into it as I did after that first day. You're right. Being the authority on climbing all of a sudden, that's a huge role. And I, I, I guess I should have expected it, but I didn't really think about it in that sense until I got there and we were, you know, explaining to everyone kind of how everything works. Um, it was great though, working with Sam for my first job. He is cool as a cucumber. He is confident and he just made my job so much easier. It was always just very relaxed. And I think to have him as my co-commentator for the first event was just really helped me be able to do what I needed to do. And I think, I think it's nice to have such a professional be there for your first time because I mean, obviously I know climbing, but he knows broadcasting. And he's studied this and he's done it for a long time. And I feel like the two of us together, it just worked out really well. A question I had was, was about that relationship because, you know, often you, you were hired, as you said, as like a color commentator, uh, which is normally the person filling in the gaps and offering uh, more in-depth analysis, which you're very well suited to because you understand the sport, but trying to be a play-by-play commentator for a sport that you don't know where your vocabulary is like non-existent is unbelievably hard um did you guys kind of work together once you met what either with sam or uh, i think you've worked with other espn commentators as well right yeah. it hasn't just been yeah. sam okay so do you guys deliberately say hey my name's megan my name's sam mm-hmm. here's what i know here's what i don't <laughs> what can we help each other out with before we end up on tv trying to fake it um how much <laughs> how much effort did you guys put in before the show Yeah, we definitely had a lot of conversations and, you know, after each broadcast, there's always time to then ask more questions or, you know, especially with jargon, certain words that like we would say versus what someone else would say who doesn't know climbing, try to stick more to the climbing terms, little things here and there. But I feel like for Sam, he retained a lot of information well, which was nice. But yeah, anytime he had questions about kind of what was going on too and I think again you bring up a good point about just even the play-by-play aspect I mean sometimes I do kind of call things like I'm doing the play-by-play because it makes more sense so I can explain what's going on and I think that's different than in other sports Um, and it changes too from discipline to discipline obviously with bouldering the boulders are so much shorter so I generally do more of the play-by-play on the boulders because there's just not a lot of time and it makes sense so that I can explain what's going or what's happening. Whereas with sport climbing, I think there's more room for um, the actual play by play commentator to call it that way because we kind of go through sections of the route, which is nice. Um, But yeah, it's definitely just a learning experience. And I've worked with a lot of different commentators. I've kind of had a different one at each competition. So we kind of start back from, square one each time which is fun and <laughs> challenging um and i think it, i mean i think it helps us all be better <laughs> i want to ask about um like storytelling as a commentator um with it, it, it climbing i've also commentated for all three disciplines not that much but it, it gets you an idea of what it feels like to try and talk about uh mm-hmm. somebody climbing each of these things um Storytelling within a within a lead climb isn't that difficult. Storytelling mm-hmm. within speed climbing is like incredibly difficult. The story almost can't be about the climb; it has to be about the yeah. bracket, basically. But in bouldering, it's it's kind of a frustrating mix of both. Um, how do you, you know, you can you can set things up as much as you want, only to have somebody mm-hmm. falling over and over. <laughs> and of course, yeah. it, a climb can be over in a matter of seconds or it can take a full five minutes. Like, have you guys talked or have you developed any thoughts about how you like to tell stories through like a bouldering finals round? I think it differs from 
competition to competition. But yes, I agree. Bouldering is definitely the hardest to kind of have a set story just because it's ever changing and we can try to predict what's going to happen. And then something else happens and just throws a wrench in what's going on. I mean, I think a perfect example is bouldering nationals this year with the women just bleeding Mm -hmm. and us having to stop. That was kind of difficult to deal with. I feel like just because we could, we all we could do is just talk about what was happening. So I think the more, the more of those competitions that we do, which I mean, we honestly haven't done that many still, I think the better prepared we'll be to deal with a situation like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that folk for me, at least I always just try to focus on who we have in the final and kind of tell mostly their story and then see how it plays out within the round. Um, and sometimes that works out nicely and other times it just does not go the way you thought it was going to go. Mm-hmm. And, and I think also we try to, at the top of each show, kind of give people a little idea of who we're focusing on a bit more and who we think might end up being the winner or, or maybe, or not even necessarily the winner, even if it, it could even be based off of just something that they did in the previous round that was just really epic too. Um, so I think that can also add to the storytelling so that it's not just result-based. One of the things that, I, that I've noticed about your commentary in particular over the past couple of years that you've been doing it is that you, you differ from how I've noticed other people commentate competitions in the past in in that you're not always referencing somebody's like outdoor accomplishments, which I love. I, 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 it drives me crazy when somebody, for example, like, you know, maybe you're commenting somebody like a Margot Hayes or somebody and like mm-hmm. a commentator will just say like, Oh, she's done like the 515 outdoors and blah, 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 blah. Because it's like, I don't want to say that that's not relevant because 515 of course is difficult, mm-hmm. extremely difficult, but it's like outdoor climbing and climbing in a competition are such a different skill set that I used to find myself thinking like, why are you even mentioning? <laughs> I mean, it's almost like so someone's true. playing football and the commentator's like, yeah, this person's great at baseball. You know, it's like, <laughs> like um, so I don't know if that's been a conscious choice by you, but it is something I want you to know that I've noticed it and it's appreciated because oh, it, I think it helps competition sort of exist s- you know, in and of itself for the sake of competition rather than always being kind of this ref- reference point with, with outdoor sends and, and whatnot. Yeah, it's definitely been a conscious choice by me, but also by production. I think especially because we're trying to introduce climbing to a lot of people who have no idea what it is and it's enough to understand the competition and then to throw in climbing grades outdoors, it just it just is harder to then explain and it would take us forever, honestly, to try and under or to try and explain how that correlates to what's happening. Cause like you said, it really doesn't, it's almost like outdoor climbing and competition climbing are two different sports. And it's interesting, actually, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because at one time it kind of wasn't like that. You know, at one time, Daniel Woods could be, you know, crushing outdoors and putting up first ascents and, you know, enter at, into bouldering nationals and still end up winning. But that's just not how it is anymore because you have a group of people that are only focusing on competition climbing. So there's just so much time that's put into the style of competition climbing that if you don't spend that time, you can't, you can't end up in a final generally like you have to be, I mean, it happens, but it's just very rare. And that's why you don't see a lot of comp climbers really climbing outside. I think quarantine has been interesting because, you know, right now, like someone like Brooke Rabatou has been climbing outside a lot because she actually has time to, but you can't really do both generally. Um, And it's not that, I feel like with comp climbers, I feel like they can go outside and like send really hard pretty easily. It's just like they don't have the time to. Mm-hmm. And then for an outdoor climber to come into a competition, it's just like a whole nother realm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and some of that transition too, I think started to happen. I think some of it has to do also with the route setting now mm-hmm. being, you know, of course, um, for example, like competition style bouldering, as everybody knows, is totally different in a lot of cases than, um, than outdoor bouldering. It's, you know, 
you know, parkour style and all that stuff. And I think, you know, part of that is what you just, what you mentioned minutes ago when you were saying your own transition, when you kind of came back to comp climbing after college and you noticed that the stylistically, it was very different than it was, um, when, when you were younger, um, that's kind of 2011, 12, 13. That's kind of when I think that this sort of new, new wave of comp style started, um, and it just, to your point, makes it even harder you, to be good at outdoor climbing and and competition or equally as good because the, the style is just very different. Yeah, it's, I mean, if you don't practice that style, it's almost impossible to be successful in a competition. Not only just having practice, but even able to recognize in that five or four minutes when you're previewing a boulder, like what the root setter intends for you to do. I mean, if, if you're not used to that style, you might not know. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's a whole thing in and of itself. I feel like when we look at competitions, we, we look at the performance and how well the person climbed and how strong they looked on the boulders. But, you know, the other part about that is just reading the root or the boulder right in like 30 seconds. If you read it wrong, it doesn't matter how strong you are, you know, it's going to be more difficult and you might not get through it you might get through it anyway but you're going to be more tired so it really has a lot to do with having that knowledge of what the root setter intends and you need practice on that to know um you've done a bunch of american ninja warrior stuff and and you mentioned that you've uh you've like sat in in the booth to co-commentate uh with with multiple people at this point uh do you have any like influences or people that you try and borrow from when you're doing your commentating do you find you have these uh, like little ticks that you've kind of adopted from somebody or inspiration that's a really good question i've actually never <laughs> really thought about that um you know that's something I've been thinking about more lately rather than when I was um, first doing it. I think at the beginning, I it all happened, like you said, so quickly. So I was just trying to make sure I did a good job and do as much as I could to prepare for what I was about to be calling. Um, but definitely lately, I've I've tried to just watch the way other commentators or you know, journalists, just in the way that they speak and the way that they frame questions, just just to better myself. And I mean, it's an array of people. I mean, even like Oprah's one of the people. I mean, I think sure, she's an yeah. amazing interviewer. Mm -hmm. So I've been, you know, just trying to figure out how I can be better in the future and, you know, maybe have more opportunities in the broadcasting realm. But at the beginning, I kind of was just <laughs> winging it, I guess, so I would say. I mean, <laughs> I, I, just, fair, yeah. just, I was trying to to, to roll with what was happening and do my best. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was, one of the things I've wondered, and I've heard this asked to Charlie Bosco as well, is like whether, he, you know, I'm curious whether you watch other sports um, just kind of with the sole purpose of analyzing the commentary or the flip side, if you if you watch another sport just for fun, if you find yourself kind of like focusing uh, <laughs> so, kind of unconsciously on the commentary, um, kind of as homework, I guess, for your new gig. Definitely. Um, I think I've done that a lot more recently. And it's actually it's interesting, too, to see how sports differ. Right. I mean, take golf, for example. The commentators are never really extremely excited about what's happening. It's pretty calm. And then for a sport like basketball, I feel like there's a lot more energy involved um, in the commentary that happens. So, yeah, I it is funny because I do find myself trying to listen to what people are saying and how they're saying it versus actually watching what's going on, <laughs> which is something I didn't really do before. I also paid attention to gymnastics a lot too, especially since that's a sport I do also know a lot about. I've definitely used that as a way to kind of prep myself. Following that, the question I was going to ask was like, is there a sport that you find you find very relatable in terms of how the commentary works? But I, I you can answer it if you want, but what I'd like to kind of question is, is the kind of like sporting culture that climbing has and how it might vary from uh, other sports. Um, climbing is, is like 
the culture of climbing is, is a lot of young people. It's a lot of adventure and rebelliousness, um, uh, drug use, cursing, just having it like it's, it encapsulates youth and, and, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a disregard for the rules. And, and there is a lot of climbing culture that would kind of abhor the idea of professionalism. Um, but when we are in the Olympics and when you're at a world championships, the, the mood changes a lot. Uh, and that's something I've, I've, thought a lot about is 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 it kind of betraying the actual nature of climbing to try and keep it clean and professionalize it and and acknowledge and not acknowledge a lot of the 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 actual personalities of the people involved or is that the only way forward and i'm curious if you if you have any feelings or thoughts about that because i, I think you'll acknowledge like it is the way we talk about climbing on a broadcast is more polished than the way we talk about each other or our climbing in a gym or out on the road right <laughs> Totally. It's definitely very different. Um, I think that when it comes to broadcasting and in competitions, I I think it makes sense that we're more in line with the more professional side of sports. I think that's what competitions create in general. Not all competitions, but ones that are more... um, The ones that, like, for example any USA climbing competition or an IFSC competition, they're going to be more on the clean side anyway, because there is, there are rules that can get you a yellow card or a red card. So I think you kind of have to approach it in a more professional manner. That being said, I guess hockey is like that and they have fights all the time. So (laughs) maybe that contradicts my point, but I get what you're saying. And I, I understand wanting to say authentic to the way climbing kind of came about, which was, you know, a lot of rebellion and going out and, you know, living in the valley in your van and climbing big walls instead of getting a job, you know, like Screw that. Screw you, was, dad. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to answer to the <laughs> man. Like, I don't need this. Uh, but I think that can still stay in outdoor climbing, but in terms of competition, it is probably better to broadcast it in a more professional manner and stay in line with some of those other sports that you do see in the Olympics, especially if that's where we're headed. I mean, personalities, they're there. And I, I mean, if that's what the athlete wants to do, I think that they should be able to do that. I think that as long as they're, you know, in line with not getting kicked out of the competition. I think that's fine. I I would love to see more personality. And again, I think maybe one of the reasons we don't see that as much as we used to take, like maybe thinking back to the PCA or something is because you do have a lot of young athletes and, and maybe they haven't found who their personality is yet or who they want to portray themselves as. And I think that that's mainly what's happening versus it just, you know, us trying to be professional. I think it's just that, it's a different group of people. That's like, for me, it's just this constant feeling of like rest in peace to the Chris Sharma, Obi Carrion, (laughs) Jason Kale trio of just like these personalities are incredible together and they're like entirely different. So part of me is just like longing for that kind of thing. No, Um, I get it. I'm with you. Those comps were a blast. And I think that there's still a realm for that um, in other competition series that aren't affiliated with the, the bigger federations. And I think that that's another part of climbing that's great is that we can have those competitions or even like a sequel block or a tuck fest. Like those are just lighter competitions. There's not as much on the line. It's like having a good time, hopefully walk away with some good cash, but you're not trying to make a U.S. team or an Olympic team or represent your country. It's a different responsibility, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder, too, if we'll see more of that as climbing, competition climbing grows into, you know, greater prominence, additional Olympics 2024 and beyond, whether there will be opportunities to kind of profile these athletes and their personalities a little bit more than we see now, whether it's like behind the scenes type stuff, whether it's kind of shows that whatever, bring them on and interview them and stuff. Because I think I feel like right now, at least uh, kind of IFSC produced um, videos or, or USA climbing productions. It's, it's really all we're getting is the competition itself. Mm -hmm. And and I understand why, you know, there's, it's, 
it's budgetary and all that. But I think that there is a lot of room where where the sport can grow and bring in some more uh, personality of these highlight some of the personalities because obviously it's there, right? Yeah. I'm sure, it's it's just it for whatever reason it's kind of not um, being brought out to to the public as much as the Obi Carryons and Chris Sharma yeah. days and stuff. And I agree. I mean, I think it'd be great to profile the athletes more and get to know them more because, like you said, they do have personalities, obviously. It's just maybe they're not showing them in the way that maybe they feel like is okay right now because it just hasn't been done as much. I, and, and again, I think they're young, so I think that you're a little more timid and also just like more focused on the task at hand. I, I mean, I know for me, whenever I was competing, I loved the crowd and I love to be in front of the crowd and, you know, do my thing. Whereas not everybody wants to do that. Um, but I mean, I think it'd be great to see that more and just yeah. getting to know the athletes and the other things that they're interested in would be a great step as well. Is, is this, is the youth, something that you because i know tyler and i've talked about this as well and and you as a media person you you know you cover the sport as well it makes it this tricky this tricky balance that you have to do because you want to um analyze things but you also have to keep in mind in a lot of cases these are still kids they're 16 years old they're 17 years old you cannot as a journalist or as a person in the media or as a commentator or whatever you you cannot or should not sometimes kind of sort of go into them as much as you would if they were like a 25 year old, you know, football player or something like that. Yeah. Like yeah, our goal is not, yeah. We don't want to like make them cry or something, yeah. you know, like, I mean, not to say that if you're younger, you would cry. It's just, you know, it, sure. it's different being an adult and being in front of a crowd and performing and then being interviewed after. I mean, if you're 16, 17, you, maybe you've never been interviewed before and, and you don't know what to say or how to say it. And I mean, for me, I'm always hoping that I can just make everyone feel comfortable to just like, like we're just talking here. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and I think having known so many of the athletes and that, that that's been helpful in my interview process with them. But yeah, I think it's just a foreign thing that they don't have a lot of experience in. And as a media person, you do kind of have to tread a little lighter just to make sure that you're making them comfortable and give them the opportunity to say what they want to say. Um, because obviously like, that's what we want to hear is what they're thinking and how they're feeling. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a little more caution involved for yeah. sure. Well, let's, let's tie two of those things together. So, so one being the, the enigmas, these like youth climbers that we just don't really understand very well, but also how you've worked with a bunch of them. So two of them being, uh, Brooke Rabatou, but also Colin Duffy, who, yeah. you know, given a different result at Pan Ams might've had a couple more years of relative anonymity, but that is not awesome. going to be afforded to him anymore. Um, I know you you were coaching at ABC while they were uh, climbing there, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if you directly coached Colin, I, I know you worked I with did. Brooke. You, okay, so let's talk yeah. about this. Tell me a bit about these kids. Like uh, Brooke is is older and, and is a little bit more expressive, but um, in terms of, of of just their kind of personality, not even within climbing, but who are these uh, these people? Like, what's going on in their in their in their minds, and how uh, are they fairly extroverted or introverted? What are they like? I mean, I think that Brooke is generally a, a bit more extroverted. Um, I only say a bit more because I feel like to me, I think of her as being so extroverted, but also I know her very well. So I have noticed as I've been at competitions watching her, she is a little more reserved than I'd say I am, but she is still more on that extroverted level. Um, she is a normal kid. She always has prioritized having friendships outside of climbing and being involved in school in the ways that she wants to. I think it was a shock to most people that she was going to go to college in that Olympic qualifying year. I think most people didn't think it was possible, but she's always been really good at listening to her gut and knowing what she was capable of. And it was a great decision for her because she proved that she can go to school, be in a sorority, do well in school and qualify for the Olympics all at the same time. I honestly think she thrives in chaos a bit, which mm. is really, really cool. But um, yeah, she. I think I think that she does a good job portraying who she is in in real life to the public. I mean, she's a very happy, kind, 
person who's a great friend. And I think that you can see that. And she loves climbing. And obviously, we all know she grew up in a climbing family. And I just think it's beautiful that, you know, she does love climbing as much as she does. Because, you know, not every kid would maybe love climbing that much growing up with parents that were very successful climbers. Um, So it's great to see her come into her own and really thrive in the competition realm as well as the outdoor realm. And yeah, I think I think she's a force to be reckoned with for sure. And I, I think she'll do great things. Um, with Colin, he it's so cool to see his entree into the adult circuit. I was so excited that he did the combined invitational um, the very first year. And he, he kind of blew everyone out of the water. I wasn't surprised because I knew his ability. But it was really cool to see other people see his talent and be so impressed by it. And he actually came to Sacramento and did some of the Boulder field competitions that I also competed in. And again, I got to see other people see him in this way. And I I thought that was really cool because having been his coach and seen him as, I mean, I'm trying to remember how old he was when I first started coaching because he was pretty little. um, He was born 2003, right? Like I think he's the same age as, as a well, loose for example, but yeah. Yeah. He's, he's young. I want to say he was probably like 11 or 12 when I first started coaching. And Mm. I mean that 11 or 12 year old boy, like I remember noticing the changes in him becoming like 13 and 14 and just seeing him evolve into this more confident um, social being. Like when he was younger, he he loved climbing so much and was so focused on it and didn't um, always worry so much about, you know, creating or, or he didn't goof off really at all as a younger kid. And then when I saw him get a little older and really mesh well with his teammates and joke here and there and have a good time. It was just so cool to see that process. And I've just continued to see that with him now that he's more in the spotlight with um, his climbing accomplishments and, you know, getting to see him in adult competitions and hanging with everyone and doing well. And then, I mean, having a chance to compete with him at a competition was really fun. I mean, I'd done that with Brooke, but I'd never done that with Colin. And so that was a cool experience. And, um, yeah, it's like he's a little grown up now and I can't wait to see what happens. And yeah, his personality gets bigger and bigger as he grows. And I, I just can't wait to see what happens with him. I just want to, for Colin specifically, something that we all kind of speculated about was as he was standing on the podium, he was a closed book. <laughs> uh, it was really tough to to grasp how he was processing with that victory in that moment. Um did you have any insight into into what may have been going through his head or what was going on in the moments before that may have left him either unsure of what the actual results were until the last minute or or if that was just his way of, of you know, that's just what he looks like when he wins yeah. the world's biggest comp to that date? <laughs> so I think there was a lot going on, mainly starting with the fact that Sean had topped the route before and then Colin topped it, but we were all unsure about time. And that whole process took a little longer than I think anyone wanted it to. Mm. And um, one thing Robin's always been really good about with the kids is we don't tell them results until they are final because you don't want to say something and get someone's hopes up and then be wrong. So everyone was kind of playing that waiting game for a while. And so I think he was you know, just prepping himself because he knew he topped the route. He knew he did all he could do, right? So in that moment, it's it's like, okay, was that enough? I couldn't have done anything else. I don't know what's happening. I'm kind of just waiting. This is such a big moment. If this is happening, oh my gosh. And it's just like so many different emotions. So I think he just was waiting and trying to figure out what was going on. And then, and then there was like that moment of disbelief that it had just happened. I mean, I definitely knew he was capable of qualifying at that competition. That being said, climbing competitions are so difficult because anything can happen. It's not a routine thing. The only thing that's routine is speed. And, and it's so quick that slips can happen all the time. So you're kind of, even though you know you're capable of something, it's kind of shot in the dark at the same time. So I think, I think he was just kind of taking it all in at that moment. 
I mean, I saw him after and he, I interviewed him after and he was definitely more smiley and more excited because he was kind of realizing what had happened. But I think it was just a lot to take in at that time. And mm-hmm. he's only 16 and I, that was only his like third big adult competition. I mean, it's kind of wild. <laughs> I I was like about to cry. I mean, not even about to. Both when Alana yeah. and Colin qualified, I cried. I'm, that's the hardest thing of commentating. I'm always like, <laughs> whenever anybody wins, I'm like losing it. I don't know what it is, but it's like, it just, it's so beautiful to see people succeed. And I just, I'm so over emotional, I guess. <laughs> Something that I wanted to ask you about was how do you stay neutral when you're commentating um, especially something like a USA climbing, like a nationals where you have, there are team ABC kids there and then there are kids from elsewhere and you have to, you know, be impartial. Um, it must be kind of difficult to sort of pull back and, and be objective. It's actually easier than you would think. I, I, like you said, I do have a lot of connections to mainly the ABC kids, but then other, I mean, I've worked with so many different kids and just competed with so many different people. So I almost have a connection to everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it's pretty easy to just stay neutral and I just find myself wanting the best for everyone. And I just find it sometimes hard to watch anyone struggle. So for the most part, I'm trying to hold my composure in the sense of not yelling like, come on, you got it, like cheering while I'm commentating. But in terms of just rooting for everyone, I honestly just am rooting for everyone. I, whenever someone wins, I'm excited. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting, yeah, because specifically at Pan Ams, I remember looking at the finals list um, I'm, I'm thinking about the men in particular, and I was looking at like Sean Bailey and Colin Duffy, and I was like, and, and uh, who, Xander Waller. I was looking at all, and I was like, oh, I'd be so stoked for different reasons if any for of these, everyone, yeah. if, for any of, yeah, with any of these people, if they would, if they would win it. So it's just interesting uh, the storylines relative to kind of each individual mm-hmm. climber. Well, and I think that comes back to just our, the climbing community in general. Like at the end of the day, we're always just psyched for people, um, mm-hmm. even if you think maybe it's someone you're not even that close to the next thing you know like you're invested in them getting to the top of a boulder or a route so i think it's easy to fall into that and be able to stay objective that way um Mm -hmm. pan ams i feel like with alana specifically i was going to definitely be heartbroken if she didn't qualify just because to watch her get so close Mm-hmm. so many times was I just I mean I'm sure it was very difficult for her um so I I mean I don't know if that would be not being objective I still was excited for everyone competing but I think I would have felt worse for her not qualifying than maybe for some other people mm-hmm. but I still wanted everyone to succeed I guess that's maybe maybe that's what ends up happening is you feel um feel more empathy for the people that i mean not even if you're closer to but just like the struggle of getting there sometimes is just something you feel for more i mean the same with sean bailey i mean he was so close and like my heart broke for him that day i was i was on cloud nine for colin but my heart was breaking on the other end for sean you know so yeah it's a lot of emotions (laughs) <laughs> let, me, let me ask you a question just about the about the American athletes. And this one makes it a little bit harder to be impartial. But based on who's going to the Olympics and and uh, the way they're set up right now, would you be able to say which one you think has has the is kind of in the best position to end up winning a medal at the Olympics? I think that is a little tricky to say just because they all have such different talents. Um, I think starting with Colin originally I would have said going into the Olympics this is going to be great for him to get that experience on the World Cup circuit because that's the one thing he's lacking is that adult circuit experience that the other athletes have so I would have thought oh he'll be able to gain that the year leading up but now looking at how things are not necessarily happening I'm, I'm wondering if he will get enough experience I hope he does But I think that would be the only tricky thing. I mean, not the only tricky thing for him. I think that a lot of times his height could be an issue. Um, It's just with the boulders, if if 
there's something that is a little bit too morpho, it's going to definitely be there. Whereas in speed climbing and sport climbing, he can kind of get past it easier. But bouldering, I think that that would be working against him a little bit. But that being said, he's definitely, you know, capable of performing but I, I would feel more comfortable for him if he had more of that adult circuit experience going into the Olympics. I think Nathaniel definitely has a good shot as well as Kyron Brooke. I mean, I, it's just so hard to predict. I mean, and same with Colin, they all have a really good shot. The other three more experience on the circuit, which I think will only help them. Um, but it's just so hard to say. It's, it all comes down to what the route looks like, what the boulders look like. Did you have a good speed run? I think Nathaniel's done a great job in the last year, really upping his game with speed. I know that was like a huge focus for him. Um, same with Brooke. I think she switched to Tomoa Narasaki's beta, which was really helpful for her. And I think for Kyra, I think that for her, it comes down to her mental game for the most part. I think sometimes she can panic, and I think that she just needs to, like, believe that she can, like she did in Toulouse, you know? So, I don't know if I answered her question specifically. I, I think they're all capable. I was, I was hoping for, like, a gut punch of a solid answer of, like, no, yeah, I'm it's sorry. this one, the rest I, of them have no chance, but... I just think that it's so hard to say that in... I mean, even well, let me, Nanya, let right? Me, let like, me, yeah, that's fair. Let me... She, be fair. Like, Oh, go ahead. I want to, so Nathaniel's the only one of the of the four of them that has won any World Cup medals, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I look at somebody like Colin and I say, you have to be the dark horse because you were a dark horse even just in the qualifying totally. event. Never competed in an international adult competition. Colin's had a pretty like dominant career as a kid, including at Youth World right. Championships. But we all agree it's like another step. Sorry, my hands are like mm -hmm. coming in at everywhere. Um, so <laughs> Colin, like Colin is a dark horse. And I would honestly say the same thing about Brooke, just because mm -hmm. of between her and Kyra, Brooke has had lesser results in World Cups than 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 Kyra has had. So Kyra and Nathaniel, per gender, would be the would be the two that I would have as the favorites. Um, but that's that's just you know my my very you know mm -hmm. backbench. I guess observing. I guess the only trick with that too is that the success that both Kyra and Nathaniel have had have been in one discipline sure. and this is a three discipline competition. So th I think that's why it also makes it so hard to just predict or just call one of them as the front runner mm -hmm. right now. Um, just because it's okay. basically so impossible to call a front runner regardless because climbing is yeah. so random. Like you don't know what you're going to climb. Yeah. How can you predict somebody if you don't know what the climb is going to be? So I, I'm really completely tricky. with you. Yeah. It's tricky. I think I do think they're all capable and I would be so excited if there was a U.S. athlete on the podium, mm -hmm. <laughs> any four of them. <laughs> and the, 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 the other thing that's tricky is just kind of rate of improvement at the combined discipline. That's another question mark. I think back, I think it was this year's or I guess 2019 combined invite. I, I think Colin um, PR'd in speed climbing like twice at the event or something mm -hmm. like that, if I remember correctly. So he's clearly like improving a lot at speed climbing. So it's mm -hmm. like, that's just another variable, um, that yeah. rate of improvement that ju I, it just adds to the, the uncertainty of it all. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's so uncertain. It's, and like I was going to say, Yanya has the most results, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it'd be even hard to say that she is for sure going to win. Sure. Because we just don't know. Sometimes root setting is bad. Capable. Guys. <laughs> yeah, no, sometimes root setting is bad. <laughs> sometimes yeah, I mean, it's good and the athletes don't yeah. read it right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and if the 2019 uh, lead circuit taught us anything, it's that as incredible as Yanya is, she's she's not um, sort of like, um, what do you say, immune to, to being yeah. beaten, you know, right? Like, um, not, so, no one's perfect. We're not yeah. robots. You, you right. can't be perfect and she's near perfect for sure <laughs> but yep. it's just nothing's guaranteed yep uh, is there a is there a direction you want to go john otherwise i'm going to flip into the uh, questions further down um well i let's see i want to talk well i here's a question i think this was actually a uh, maybe somebody wrote in with it but since we're kind of talking about it right now i'd be curious to get your thoughts about the, the big question what are your thoughts about the combined discipline because <laughs> Um, 
This is this is one of Tyler's favorite subjects. I'm so I, over this. <laughs> I, 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 well, I'll hear Megan. I, I want to hear what Megan has to say. I have some kind of thoughts on it, um, but uh, I'd be curious, Megan. The combined discipline discipline is so difficult, in my opinion. I think that it's asking a lot of the athletes, and they've done a good job you know, doing what they have to do to get used to this discipline. But it's so much climbing. There's so much, there's no room for error, yet there's the possibility of error happening at any moment. And then all of a sudden, because of that error, you could have no chance in like a second. Um, And that could happen in a speed run, or it could happen in one attempt on a boulder. It's just wild how near perfect you have to be in order to do well in the combined format and you know i'm sure there's been so much talk about the fact that it kind of takes away from people who had only focused on one discipline which i do agree that that has happened and hopefully in the future we can have each discipline by itself but i mean i guess for now this is what or this is the way it is but it's definitely it's definitely a hard discipline to, or it's a hard format to be a part of, to be watching, to watch how quickly things can change. It's hard to keep up with sometimes in terms of where people are. Um, I can't imagine competing in that format. It's it's very high stress in my opinion. Um, If you, if you as an athlete had to choose three sports that you could put together into the Megan Martin combined sport what three sports would those be <laughs> well it would definitely be climbing pole vaulting and ninja warrior i guess Is yeah, that okay, sure. sport? I don't yeah. Even which, know, which discipline of climbing though bouldering i guess yeah uh bouldering yeah i would do bull even though bouldering, these are though, all really upper hard. body <laughs> like i was gonna say how are you gonna do yeah. a boulder round followed by an a and w round followed by like that's that's rough yeah, I'm going to be pumped. Yeah. yeah, maybe I should do that. <laughs> no, but bouldering also is so tricky because it's like it has the most room for variables to happen, right? Even if mm-hmm. you consider yourself a great boulderer and you've been generally successful, like one bad round or one bad or one bad performance on a climb that maybe just didn't suit you very well could keep you from getting into like a semifinal or a final. Whereas I think in the lead slash sport climbing discipline, you kind of know where you stand going into it. There's not as much room for like things to just happen. I think mm-hmm. in bouldering, we see that a lot where one great performance on a climb that just happened to suit you can boost you up. It's just wild how it happens that way. So it's hard to want to bank on bouldering, you know? Yeah. <laughs> John wrote down a question that I'd like to ask as it relates to this um, about the Um, you competed in the Boulder Field uh, Masters uh, in 2019, which is something I'm going to have to talk to those guys about uh, (laughs) because talking about formats is guarantees zero views, but I love it. It's a great conversation starter. (laughs) Uh, But but you've competed also in Adidas Rockstars and and you've kind of gotten to get a feel of these different comp formats. Uh, And so the question is basically, is there there a particular competition format that isn't getting as much of a spotlight as you think it may deserve, either from uh, the climber's perspective or like the broadcasting perspective? Hmm. That is, I mean, I feel like for the most part, everyone has kind of been doing the same format. So generally you don't get different formats. You just name two competitions that actually do different formats, mm-hmm. but there really aren't a lot. Um, I like the idea of a flash competition. And that was one of the things we did at the Boulder field. I've never been in a more stressful situation the idea of only having one try on on boulders is mm. terrifying. I, I found myself like walking up to the wall and like walking back away from it because I wasn't ready to get on the climb. I what I really like about that format as well is it prepares you to approach climbs to flash them. And I think for the World Cup circuit format, that would be a great way to practice. I mean, that's something I had practiced in the past. Um, in training sessions, but it's definitely different in a competition um, arena. 
because there's more on the line and you're more nervous. So I think it'd be cool to see more of those. I think that there are also people that are really good at flashing in general. And I think that's a cool skill to have. Um, yeah, that, that was just a very interesting format. And it was funny. It was tense. If you ask anyone who competed that weekend, it was a tense feeling. Not tense against each other. It's just we were all kind of scared to climb. That makes me so happy. I'm so glad to hear that. Like, that's my dream. I love that. Anytime I see competitors show up at a comp with a surprise pool and everybody looks like they're having too much fun, I'm like, that. Ah, this is bullshit. Like, let's let's amp this up a little bit, guys. Well, so. <laughs> it's funny, too, because then the next competition was, I think, the Force Majeure. Mm -hmm. And I just remember just such a sense of relief knowing that I could at least try things <laughs> multiple times. It like wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, and we were all just so much happier. It was really funny. Uh, I, oh, I, the other part of that competition series that was great too was in the last competition for the Modern Climber, we did that video game format. And I actually really liked that. The idea that you have to complete the boulder to move on to the next one. I think that's really cool because that's one thing that in other scoring systems that USA Climbing has had. I remember there was this one scoring system where it was about topping the the boulders that had been topped the least. You got more points for that. Um, or, or the previous one where like tops mattered for everything, which is more similar to IFSC. But with that, sometimes it's like you could climb and get almost to the top of every boulder and not do it but you've actually done more moves than someone who did one boulder and didn't go off yeah. the ground. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you have to complete things to move on really actually gives you the person who did the best. And I yeah. think that's the only time it's very clear. So that was a really cool experience to have. Yeah, that, that, one, that one bothers me just like the one thing, and I know the root setters are, are aware of this. Like, I'm really glad they tried all these formats. They all do have weaknesses, but but the one with that one is like, if you put the wrong problem at the start and you wreck the better climber because it's not mm. their style, you're like, That's oh, you just, true. you don't get to climb the other problems because screw you because this is what we decided yeah. is first, right? It, it was still mm -hmm. awesome to watch. I loved all that stuff and I'm, I'll definitely have to uh, talk to those guys, but yeah. That is a good point though. Although it kind of turned out all right, I think mm -hmm. for like for the men's side, people caught up. Yeah. Uh, and then even I mean, I ended up winning for the women, and I was the second to last person off of the first boulder. Right. Like I stayed on the first boulder longer than most of the women, um, and it wasn't until the third boulder that like that really pushed me into the um, position to win. But yeah. yeah, it's it's fun to think about this in a broadcasting uh point of view from a broadcasting point of view because tyler you and i have talked about several times how in the combined format the bouldering just kind of has a potential to just like kill the momentum um and it also is a by far the most complex for the non-climbing public to understand the in terms of the scoring and everything i mean speed climbing is pretty obvious uh lead climbing is very obvious you know if you if you if you fall you're done uh bouldering is just this weird thing and Megan as we were saying earlier it, it causes you to have to like fill time sometimes when mm -hmm. the, for these repeated and it's also just like repeated attempts on the same problem which I think um you know there could be a little bit of interest sort of degradation there too mm -hmm. from people watching it I don't know if the IFSC would ever completely overhaul their bouldering format but I think like slotting in for the combined format, having the bouldering portion be a flash format would be a way to just kind of guarantee that the tension stays high in bouldering, just like it's high for the other disciplines. The momentum doesn't get zapped for what could amount to just like five minutes of a competitor trying a move and failing. Um, you know, interesting to think about. That is definitely interesting to think about. And even more interesting because Pan Ams for the men actually kind of turned into mm. a flash format. Yeah. Um, and we've seen that happen a few times, but it would be it would be different if you approach it like knowing that you only had the one try because it definitely changes the way you approach everything. Um, obviously, when you get to a boulder, you always want to try to do it on your first try, but to know you cannot try it again changes mm -hmm. your whole um, approach and feeling towards it mm -hmm. and the stress. Yeah. Level. It yeah, props to the Boulder Field people. I think it was such a cool idea that they had to. Th I mean, there's a lot of great things about that competition. That that series. Uh, first and foremost, the the cash payout was was huge. The which best is great thing ever. Yeah, which, <laughs> I've never made that much money in comps. <laughs> yeah, to get that kind of winner's purse is is fantastic. Thanks, but Carlo. 
also the fact that Carlo and, and the, the setting team there and, and th that they're playing around with the best comp format. It's just uh, it was really good because those both all three of those, the idea was the ideas were really cool and interesting for those. It was fresh, right? And yeah. we're so used to seeing things done one way. So it was nice to see someone take a different approach to it and try something new and not just try something new and in having even a specific theme for each competition, but just the format in each competition be so different each time. Mm -hmm. I was always going into each one. I was like, wait, so what's going on the finals in this competition? Gotta I want to make sure. Book, I you know? right? <laughs> yeah. They'll email you a rule book before each competition. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going pretty long. So John, how about we both uh, pick one last question uh, and then we'll go to the viewer questions and wrap it up. Um, I know the question, I'll let you think about yours. Uh, so mine's going to be, um, uh, geez, the question I wrote is way too long. So let me just word it myself. Uh, but it's, you're a fairly multifaceted person in your professional life. You are an athlete primarily, but, uh, you've also become a TV personality. Uh, you've also done modeling, which is very relevant to this as well. And you've been a coach. So you've been around a lot of young climbers and impressionable people. And something you end up talking about a lot over history is, is body image, uh, in climbers. You recently uh, had a, a conversation with Kai Leitner. I haven't watched it. So the question I really have is, after all these discussions and something that you've been in the middle of this discussion for so long is, it, have you settled upon what you think could be the most important improvement that we could make as a sport, whether that's at a coaching level or at an organizational level? Like, is there something you think we could implement fairly quickly and simply to make some progress on that issue? I think that it would be really helpful at a coaching level and at an organization level. Um, I think that I think people need to be educated in the way that they approach um, specifically kids about, and not even just approach because it's not even that coaches are necessarily saying things to children like you need to lose weight or something. I mean, yes, sometimes that does happen and I don't think that's okay. But it's also the small side comments that give you this idea that something's happening, like whether it's, oh, are you sure you want to eat that? Or no, you can't have that snack or that's not healthy. I just think that these are things that shouldn't be said. Um, kids have crazy metabolisms, right? This, that's the time where things don't really matter as much in terms of, I mean, obviously we want to put good things in our bodies, but you know, Cheetos are not going to kill you either, you know? <laughs> and I don't think that we should give children this idea that they're doing something wrong. Um, from my own experience, my parents always tried to buy food that was good for us. But I mean, I was also allowed to eat things that weren't good for me. And I never, never was told I was fat or I was too big or anything like that. It was always positive reinforcement. And so I feel like the more positive people can be, and like not make people think that there's just one body type that can be successful. I mean, I remember competing at the Toronto World Cup and I think I got 13th that year. And I remember someone writing on my Facebook like, oh, you did great, but maybe you should lose some weight because that seems mm -hmm. to be like the people who are doing well are a little, you know, thinner. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, I, like, I cannot believe someone just wrote that. And Hmm. Me reading that in my 20s would be way different than someone reading that in, like as a teenager, right? I am equipped at that time to deal with that and realize, okay, like I don't care what this person says. This is my body. I love my body. I'm not going to change it. But saying things like that around kids, they're so susceptible to everything at that time. And I think that I think we should focus more on just if something's not working, Let's, let's get better at that thing. Let's get stronger. Let's get more technique. Let's get more footwork, more tension when we climb, all of that stuff, instead of thinking that it's a weight thing. I mean, I, I mean I've even heard, you know, successful World Cup athletes revert back to saying, oh, well, I'm fat today. And that should never be the reason why you think you're not doing well. You know, it's not about that. Like, what is two pounds going to do? It's not going to do anything. And, mm. and. I mean, it's the same way, like I went to a boulder the other day and I did a workout in the, in the morning and I, the whole time I was like, it doesn't matter. I did a workout. I can still do this boulder. It doesn't matter that I, you know, already worked out. It's fine. And the more I told myself, the more I got it in my head that it was okay. 
So if we just practice being positive about our bodies and that we can do everything no matter what we look like, because we're all going to look different. We all have different body types and that will lead to different strengths and weaknesses in our climbing. But we need to just accept what's happening and not try to change it because it's not healthy and it's scary. And on the organizational side, I feel like there needs to be more steps in place to help people who are struggling and, and give guidance and be able to deal with the situation instead of being like, well, they're getting results. Let's just let them, you know, have an eating disorder. That's not okay. You, mm-hmm. You're doing that person a disservice. I mean, that's, that's a lifelong struggle you have to deal with. And I, I it, it really breaks my heart that in our sport, it has happened. It just keeps happening over and over and over again. We see all these successful athletes come out and say that they've been struggling with an eating disorder. And that that's just not okay. You need more role models out there promoting body positivity and promoting just dealing with or not dealing with, but using the body that you've been given and working through your weaknesses and not thinking about weight. How, how common, uh, maybe common's the wrong word, but, uh, you know, how prevalent in your estimation are eating disorders um, at sort of like the, the high level, eat, the elite level of competition climbers? You know, I think that's a tricky question because... I honestly don't know anymore because mm-hmm. there have been people that I know that I would have never suspected of having an eating disorder, you know? Mm-hmm. And I thought I was pretty yeah. in tune with when with noticing that. Um, mm-hmm. But I've been shocked by a few of the people who have come out and said that. And that being said, I think it's possible that a lot of people are struggling, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing. It's, I feel like for me, I've always known you didn't have to look sickly per se to have an eating disorder, Mm -hmm. but I was still ended up being surprised by some of the people who did say they had one. And I just thought I, I was just, I couldn't believe it. So I think it's a bigger problem than people realize. And I think that we just need to, you know, put more of that positivity out there that that's not the way to obtain things. There Mm -hmm. are other ways to get to achieve the goals that you want to achieve. Um, Yeah. There's a spectrum of severity. And I think what we're finding is a lot of times like going back to the, the kid, the youth thing, a lot of people might be somewhere on that spectrum and it's only when they get a little older and they're able to kind of look back on their youth that they're able to kind of see, oh, that was like not not healthy. That I was mm-hmm. sort of on that spectrum of having an eating disorder and stuff. So Yeah, I mean, I don't know. For me, I've always been someone who likes moderation with everything. Um, I don't like to tell myself I can't have anything. (laughs) I just, I just, for me, that doesn't work. Um, so I think that that's been the only reason that I haven't struggled with it because it is hard also to see other people struggle with it. And then you see a positive, um, result coming from it in terms of their, their climbing abilities. And then you start to look at yourself and think, well, I mean, am I doing something wrong? And, and that's another thing that just needs to be addressed. We, that's why I think we need to be more open. I I would love it if more athletes were open because then, then more people could see that there was actually a problem and that's not the way to go about it. Um, so that you can have goals and role models that are, you know, not taking drastic measures and trying to just like work hard and get better at things. Mm -hmm. John, do you have a last question? Yeah, I do. And it, I guess it kind of relates to that because I know USA climbing has kind of focused on the eating disorder aspect. They, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of aware that it's a problem that needs to be addressed um, or organizationally they're, they're, you know, they're putting Mm -hmm. efforts towards that. So I would be curious Megan, what you would like to see or kind of what you envision the future of 
USA Climbing in the next five years, 10 years? And you can kind of take that in whatever direction you think. I know you're involved, obviously, with the commentary. You're also, you know, you're on committees and, and whatnot. So you, as someone who kind of wears a lot of hats in the organization, I'm curious um, where you'd like to see growth and, and progress and all that. In regard to... The in, in USA Climbing. In general. Yeah, in general. Mm. I mean, I think that in the last couple of years, the organization has definitely taken a lot of great steps to be more organized and just have like a, a clear goal of what they're trying to do um, and, and really be on the athlete side. I think that that has always been something that maybe wasn't so clear before. Um, you know, they've clearly been trying to find ways to support the athletes. And I think that that's really important. Um I would definitely like to see, you know, more, I feel like going back again to the eating thing, I think that it'd be great to see, you know, maybe some programming involved in order to educate people a little bit better. I mean, we've added safe sport. I think they'd be cool to have some sort of literature around ways to um, discuss an eating disorder and maybe that's what we need to do maybe we just need to discuss it so that people know and then can you know go from there um i also think that usa climbing has really been focused on you know trying to create more diversity within the federation and i think that that's i mean i i've been a part of that in many ways and i i think we're on the right track with that i think one thing with climbing in general is it's we're still a sport that people just don't know about and i i want more people to know about us and i want us to find ways to you know insert ourselves into areas that maybe have never heard of climbing and make it more affordable for everyone that's always been something that i've been really passionate about um and just have more maybe more sub organizations within the organization to focus a little bit more on um, how to bring more people into the sport. Cool. Um, so we are going to go to the uh, like viewer questions. And the first one is, uh, <laughs> is actually about that. And it's from a supporter of the podcast. So uh, I wanted to just re-ask it. Maybe we'll just spend a couple more minutes talking about it because they did ask, but Jamie uh, from Ontario just wanted to know how do you think national state or provincial organizations like USA climbing should tackle the topic of diversity? Um, and, and just to spark a short conversation, uh, something I'm always trying to debate about this and for the most part, I'm thinking about it from like a gym perspective these days, mm -hmm. not so much. I'm not involved in an organization anymore, but it, it is always trying to question like, you know, uh, should we be reaching out first to uh, to kids? Should we be reaching out to adults at first? There's a million different types of incentives or actions you yeah. can take. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything specific that you have seen over time from, from your friends or just in your career where you're like, oh, that's mm -hmm. a really interesting initiative or just way of doing things that has maybe inspired you. Totally. So I did a clinic at Memphis Rocks a few years ago, and I feel like what they're doing there is a great idea. I know I know not every gym can do that because it's very different. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's funded in a very different way. But this idea that, you know, you pay what you can when it comes to climbing is really cool. I think that there should, it would be cool if more gyms did that. And I've had some conversations with people from USA Climbing and it'd be cool if they could partner with gyms and make something like that more possible so that it wasn't coming down to a financial reason that people couldn't go to the gym. And it's like, pay what you can. If you can pay more, pay more too. I mean, that's the other thing is if you are in a different position, it'd be great for more people to help those who aren't. Um, so I think that, I think that what they're doing there is really great. And if we could see something more like that, I know it can't be exactly the same thing, but more along those lines, um, another great organization I think is the one climb that Kevin Jorgensen has been doing and just bringing the climbing to boys and girls clubs. I think that's a great idea. Um, just seeing more of that would be awesome. And when I moved to Sacramento, that's something I thought about more because all of a sudden I was in a very different place than I was in Boulder. I was all of a sudden in a very diverse city. Um, and, you know, 
being in Boulder, I kind of forgot about that. It's such a different place. It's very um, homogenous and it's freaking um, white out there, man. It's pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's extremely. It, it, but it's 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 funny because when you're there, you kind of start to think that that's reality, and then you go somewhere else, and you're like, whoa there's so much more I could be doing and so many more ways I could be helping and um, so many more people could know about climbing. And I would love to be a part of that and helping people find that. Um, So yeah, I think that USA climbing is on a great track. Uh, We're always trying to do better. And And if any rich Hollywood directors would like to cover the the fees of (laughs) help monetarily that would be great but I mean from when I started climbing to now it's already so much different and way more diverse I mean I was the only brown black kid in a competition for the most part when I first started climbing and then I remember coaching and going to youth nationals and seeing so much more diversity already so I think it's just moving a little slower but I I don't necessarily think it's because of anything other than the fact that people just don't know about climbing. I think that that's a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I would love, to, I, I'm always just trying to make climbing more visible so more people have the opportunity to try it. Yeah, and going back to the cost thing, you know, the the uh, being a, more people um, being able to afford climbing, it is, it's kind of interesting because you think about it as like a kind of a minimalistic sport, especially mm-hmm. compared to something like football where you have to buy pads and helmet and all this stuff. It's like, yeah, all you need to climb is just like a pair of shoes and a chalk bag or whatever. But then when you start thinking more about it, you think, okay, well, a gym membership costs money. If the kid wants to compete, then, I mean... You, especially with like you know if you're driving to regionals or divisionals or something mm-hmm. like that i mean that that's a cost in and of itself yeah. um so the the costs of of being a climber a gym climber a competitor you know it does add up really quickly when you kind of start crunching the numbers and and that's something that's also changed from when i first started climbing it was not nearly as expensive when i first started i came from gymnastics and my mom was like wow this is so cheap i just have to buy you shoes a chalk bag a harness and the gym membership's not even that expensive but with the way that climbing's evolved and the way gyms have gotten bigger everything is just more expensive um so it i mean i think it would be great to have ways to make it more affordable um, and coming down from USA climbing to the gyms across the nation, I think would be a great place to start if they were partnered and we could have some sort of, I mean, I don't know what that is. I just, mm. I, it would be a great thing if it could yeah. happen. <laughs> it's It's been great to see the success of Memphis Rocks because I know, I remember covering it when it first opened and the big question in the gym industry was like, it's a cool idea. Like, can it work? Mm-hmm. Is it going to work? And the fact that they've been able to to sustain us to stay in business for for a few years now is is cool. Yeah, yeah for anybody wondering, awesome. just because I know we didn't actually address what Memphis Rocks is, but it's it is a, a not for profit climbing gym in Memphis that is funded and created by Tom Shadiak. Is that how you pronounce his name? But uh, anyway, Shadiak. Shadiak, yeah. somebody that uh, has earned a lot of money working in Hollywood, um, and uh, it was basically an initiative, from my understanding, that he spearheaded. So. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a very different model of funding, um, and also a unique location based on the demographics of where it is. Um, so, yeah, just because we didn't really address what Memphis Rocks actually was, <laughs> yeah, we talked totally. about it for a couple minutes, but yeah. Well, and maybe that's another thing too: is putting gyms in locations that they haven't been in before. You know, like like they did at Memphis Memphis mm-hmm. Rocks. That part of town is one that you know people wouldn't generally think of putting a climbing gym there. But maybe we need to be doing more of that so that it is more visible on that scale um, rather than just, you know, hoping that people (laughs) kind of find their way to climbing Mm because it's kind of hard to do. Yeah. No, you're totally right. It, it is when I look at the Toronto map of gyms, like we have a ton of gyms in Toronto, but mm-hmm. you find like, hey, where are the big blank spaces? And you're like, oh, these are the most diverse neighborhoods in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it is certainly a reality and, and uh, yeah, a question to be had for people opening gyms. Um, let's go to some more like rapid fire questions. Just a few more because this has already gone pretty long. John, I know you had a couple. Do you have mm-hmm. like one or two you want to pick out? Sure. Um Megan, who are somebody wrote in asking who are some of your climbing heroes? Um, I would definitely say that. Well, first of all, I think 
I feel like Lynn Hill is one for most everyone. I think that I just love the idea of not putting yourself in a box and believing that you can do anything. And I, I think that she embodied that with um, freeing the nose. I, it's such a great accomplishment. Um, and just really big for women in general. I feel like we need more of that. We need more just going after anything and everything and not being held back at all um and then robin rabatu mm-hmm. i i know her very well and she's been really helpful in guiding me in my career and um mm-hmm. i just feel like i've learned so much from her even even when i think about just having children and hoping that they love climbing and just watching <laughs> what she's done with brooke and sean it, it's honestly incredible those kids love climbing so much and i think it's so cool because it wasn't necessarily going to happen that way uh mm-hmm. so yeah, I definitely look up to her in very many or in a lot of different ways from mm-hmm. a businesswoman to a successful climber, great mother. So definitely those two women for sure. <laughs> um, Riley asked, what workout always improves your mood if you're having a bad day? Mm. I see. I want to say climbing, but that's not true because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it, it ends up being frustrating and then you're not happy anyway. Uh I guess I would say my HIIT workouts. I'm so shocked I'm going to say that because half the time I don't want to do them. But then at the end, I feel great. So, yeah, the cardio HIIT workouts. Mm. But, I mean, climbing generally makes me happy. But, you know, sometimes A, a bad climbing day is, is like a morbid <sighs> day, right? That's like it a really career is. ender. So. You can yeah. go into like a deep hole sometimes, too. Yeah. Like, I've found myself at the gym just trying a boulder over and over again. And it's like an indoor boulder. It doesn't matter. And I can't let it go. Mm. I, I want to say, I can't remember if it was Kyra Kondi. I don't want to misspeak if it wasn't her, but there was some competitor who said something like, if they're at a, uh, doing a, a climbing session at a gym and they know it's just a bad session, they'll just like pack up and leave. They're, they'll just, you know, they'll just be like, I'm done. I'm not going to climb. I know it's going to be a bad session. <laughs> um, I don't know if it was, I feel like it was Kyra, but I'm not sure. But I always Sounds remember like things. I, I was like, I really admire that because sometimes it's really hard to walk away. But I guess oh, if you yeah. kind of have that sort of mindset where you're just like, nope, it's not happening today. See you later. You know. Yeah, I might have to adopt that. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, John, I'll um, give you the last question if you want to ask one final uh, viewer question. Sure, I do. This is, uh, let me, I t- it's on my phone here. It was sent to me. Um, one of our longtime viewers, Ryan, asked it. Shout out to Ryan. Appreciate the uh, viewership. He said, uh, Megan, what do competitors typically do in isolation between boulders one through four during an open finals? Um, I guess like when the comp is actually going on and you're just mm-hmm. like back in there, what's uh, what's going on? So it depends on the venue generally because um, on it. Well, that doesn't depend on it, but um, sometimes it's different than others just depending on the venue, like when you're outside in Vail, I feel like it's different than when you're in an arena um, in Oregon. Generally, it's quiet. People aren't really supposed to talk in between boulders. Um, I feel like it's changed so much because I've also, I'm now I'm thinking back to finals and different time periods where there was the four plus clock and just now a four minute clock because I mean, those situations, sometimes you're, more talkative especially with the four plus clock because people could be out there for like 10 minutes sometimes so that kind of changed things I guess in a final once you've you've been on a climb and you and someone else has if you guys are talking you're usually just quietly talking about what just happened for you and then once everybody's been on the climb there's a little more chit chat about that um but otherwise I feel like you're pretty focused I, you know, this question is interesting because I don't even know what the men do. I only know what the women do. <laughs> and it could be completely different because I feel like we kind of talk a lot, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't I'm not sure if the boys do. Well, it's, it's interesting that it sounds it, well, it's, it sounds like it's social, which is maybe not what I would have guest i would you know i mean i'm not sure it depends on the competitor i'm, I'm mm-hmm. sure but like it does yeah. um I, I i would have guessed that people are just kind of like in the zone and 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 not talking to each other but uh maybe you know maybe i'm wrong sometimes i think it just depends and it, you know depending on where you are in the lineup too um mm-hmm. i mean i'm now i'm thinking back to bouldering nationals in 2018 and 
we actually weren't even in the back. We were out in front of the crowd. And, you know, between boulders, Margo and I were just gluing and taping our bloody hands the whole time. So <laughs> it definitely can change um, from time to time. But yeah, I guess the general thing now is everyone goes into the back. But I think there's more conversing than people would guess. Um, but obviously only if you've both already been on the boulder because we're not trying to give away beta yeah. <laughs> um, to everyone. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like climbing is just so social, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you're always wanting to be like, oh my gosh, like, what did you do? I got stuck here and we're just trying to get our beta. And then, you know, maybe two people before you go, you're refocusing on the next boulder that you're going to get on. So. Mm -hmm. It's the, the the bloody fingers thing is really funny. This just made me think of it because we were talking about uh, Sam Farber and like the ES the the commentators that are aren't that aren't climbers. And I remember there was one com uh, competition that you were commentating, and I can't remember who the 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 other commentator was, but he was making a big deal. Oh my gosh, the competitors are you know their fingers are bleeding, and I remember you were just kind of like, yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> like, it wasn't a big I deal think... to anybody that knows climbing. Exactly right. Yeah, but, but for uh, a long time, I couldn't tell you a competition I was in that I didn't bleed, you know, so yeah. <laughs> it's kind of par for the course. Um, the holes are so textured, they're setting such dynamic movements, and there's volumes everywhere. It's so hard not to end up bleeding at the end. <laughs> right, but if you're coming at it not knowing climbing, you're just like, these people you're are like, Why? bleeding? <laughs> like, this is crazy. Yeah. yeah, totally. It was interesting to see. I think that was Sean Woodland. Um, yeah. That was bouldering nationals. And yeah, he was definitely pretty shocked by it. And I was just kind of unfazed. The way you just, you're like, yeah, it kind of, it happens. Like I, yeah. I could tell that Sean, you know, he was silent, but I could tell that he was yeah. just kind of walloped by your comments. <laughs> yeah. I got, I was, I think I'm seeing for a Toronto world cup and Sakuru Hori or somebody like had like a really brutal cut on their finger. And for some reason I thought it would be appropriate to like keep updating the people in the arena and like what was going on with his finger. And a few minutes later, the organizer comes over and he's like, could you shut up about the blood stuff? That's like not, not really. Appropriate. But anyway, so that's, that's yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're going to keep talking forever. If, uh, if we, uh, if we don't stop ourselves and I definitely need a bathroom break. So first of all, thanks John, as always. And thank you so much megan for joining us for basically two hours to just shoot the shit and talk <laughs> wow, about what's going on hours. yeah it's uh this clock is ticking so i really yeah, appreciate I had a blast you. With you guys cool thanks so much and yeah i'm sure thanks, sometime megan. we'll we'll do it again uh thank you of course to all of uh, all of you watching and special thanks to the g5 for supporting us uh if you want to support the podcast you can always uh, uh subscribe to the patreon you can join us in our discord to just chat about all things climbing and of course make sure you have liked and left a comment and subscribed uh as i know as i know you're definitely going to do uh so thanks again and we'll see you next month with wait another... wait wait real fast, oh, real fast, real fast. Uh, i just want to say megan if there are any sponsors that you want to plug you can i, oh. I don't know if there's anybody you, or you know any shout out website anything like that i have a website it's meganmartinclimbing.com uh thanks to all my sponsors um <laughs> <laughs> if you want to buy some great shoes go get some so shoes <laughs> you, megan you had so i i don't want to i know you're, you're wrapping up tyler but megan you had you sold t-shirts which was the coolest thing you had megan martin t-shirts oh yeah um like uh i i don't know like a year ago or something like that i yeah. thought that that was the coolest idea really? um you know, to have, you know, like branded t-shirts and, and I saw on Instagram, people were buying them and stuff like that. I don't know if you have any plans to bring them back, but I think people love them. So that was a really cool idea. Yeah, I might bring them back. That's actually, so that's really big in the ninja community is to like make t-shirt t-shirts and sell them. And, um, I've never, I've always just been myself on the show. Like a lot of people have their own like ninja name and whatnot. So I never really thought of making a shirt, but then my mom was like, Oh, that picture that they used for the the artwork for the season of season 10 is so amazing. Let's make a Megan Martin t-shirt. And I was like, uh, okay, if that's what you want to do, but I, yeah, I love it. It turned out great and people did like it. Yeah. So maybe I'll bring it back. Thanks for reminding bring me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm just saying, I, I would love to wear more t-shirts with just the name of a ball and climber. Like I, if you're walking around with a Kobe Bryant Jersey, I want to have right? a Jersey for the people that I admire in my sport. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, well, since John absolutely wrecked all my momentum, we're just going to wrap it up and this is the last episode ever. So screw it. But anyway, thanks again, everybody. 
appreciate Thank Megan you. hopping in for this final uh, final go round. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, final reminder, uh, check out Megan's YouTube channel. I think it's what youtube.com slash Megan Magoo, if I'm oh, remembering yeah. the retro YouTube name, where you can, find, <laughs> you can find her, uh, her weekly workouts over there. And uh, another reminder, the Austrian Summer Series starts July 8th or 9th. So if you want to watch comps with us, uh, connect with us. We might have a watch party or something like that. Otherwise, this is officially the end. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.